The final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 13558 in the name of Bill Kidd on the NPT, the Marshall Islands and UK Government's failure to meet its obligations. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Bill Kidd to open the debate. Seven minutes, please, Mr Kidd. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, may I be indulged uh, with your... Uh, with your willingness to welcome in the uh, gallery um, the Honourable Alexander Kement, Austrian Disarmament Ambassador and Arms Control Person of the year 2014. Um, he's sitting up there in the gallery and I think he's someone who um, we're all very grateful um, for the efforts that he's made in reducing the threat to the world of nuclear weapons over the years and certainly um, last year when he won the award. I also wish to thank all of those MSPs who signed my motion on the NPT, the Marshall Islands and the UK Government's failure to meet its international treaty obligations. The Non-Proliferation Treaty on Nuclear Weapons NPT Review Conference met again at the United Nations in spring of this year. I say again because it meets every five years and has done so since 1970. So obviously it has not yet achieved its uh, aims, which were set out in 1968. The reason it was set up was, as the UK did, uh, to get countries to sign up to and ratify the articles of the NPT. That was 1968. It includes Article 6, which creates an obligation of good faith, of cessation of the nuclear arms race and the achievement of nuclear disarmament. So that's 47 years we've been waiting for that good faith to come to pass. And where does the Republic of the Marshall Islands fit into the long-term future of the international obligations of those signatories of the NPT and yet who maintain nuclear weapons arsenals? Well, the Marshall Islands is a small Pacific nation which, following the Second World War, was placed under trust status by the United Nations for protection and development by the USA. Unfortunately, when something has the name trust attached to it, I don't necessarily look for anything of great hope, because frequently trust is something which is taken as granted by most of us, but not delivered upon by nations around the world when it comes to their own best interests. So placed under trust status by the United Nations, Protection and development by the USA. Tragically, however, the islands and their occupants were used as a nuclear weapon testing ground by the United States in the years between 1946 and 1958. During this 12-year period, a total of 67 nuclear tests were carried out in the Marshall Islands, notably at Bikini and the Nevitak. The total explosive yield of these tests averages out at an incomprehensible equivalent of 1.6 Hiroshima-sized bombs every day for 12 years. The people of the Marshall Islands have suffered catastrophic and irreparable damage as a result of the testing of these weapons, including genetic damage to the people who live there. However, as reparation for the devastation wreaked upon their land and population, the government of the Marshall Islands does not seek financial compensation. How could you possibly sort out the problems that have been caused with money? That's too much of an idea of Western societies. Rather, they have filed nine separate applications at the International Court of Justice one for each of the nine nuclear armed states, as well as another lawsuit against the USA in the US Federal Court for their actions during the period of the trust status. The lawsuits are intended to highlight breaches of existing international law, both Article 6 of the NPT and customary international law, both of which call for compliance with good faith negotiations for an end to the nuclear arms race at an early date, and then to that for to lead to nuclear disarmament. Of the nine nuclear-armed nations, three accept the compulsory uh, jurisdiction 
of the ICJ, these being the UK, India and Pakistan. And oral arguments are due to proceed in the International Court in March 2016. In the spirit of these courageous actions by the Marshall Islanders and under the auspices of international law, mindful of the duties placed on the UK Government by their signature and ratification of the 1968 NPT obligations, in particular with the provisions of Article 4, 6, I believe it would be incumbent on all parties to follow the example of the great majority of the world's governments and pursue a non-nuclear weapons strategy for cooperation. This would include the UK Government halting the planned preparatory work for the upgrade and replacement of the Trident nuclear system at Faz Lane Coolport on the Clyde prior to its dismantlement and removal. And crucially, for Trident not to be relocated to anywhere else on these islands in order, therefore, that the UK would comply fully with its obligations under the NPT. President Officer, I wish to thank the Honourable Tony de Brum, Foreign Minister of the Republic of the Marshall Islands, for his friendship and support in providing an understanding of the background to this internationally important case. And I also wish to express my sincere thanks for the support of the Government of the Republic of the Marshall Islands in their welcoming of this debate here in the Scottish Parliament. And also, and I think this is really what it's all about, I wish to thank the Marshall Islands people for their vow to fight so that no one else on earth will ever again experience the atrocities as perpetrated on their territory and on their people. Thank you very much, President Officer. Many thanks. Uh, we are tight for time this evening. There are a number of members who wish to speak in the debate. So at this stage, uh, I'm minded to accept a motion from Bill Kidd under Rule 8.14.3 that the debate be extended by up to 30 minutes. Mr Kidd. Sorry, I actually I was being congratulated because I was so good and I can't be. Would you care to move a motion that we extend would you care to move a motion that we extend the debate, Mr Kidd? Yes, I would. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is that agreed? Thank you. Even so, I would ask members to keep to time, please. And I also have several members who have to leave early to go to other parliamentary events and therefore I'll try and accommodate them as best I can. I call first of all David Torrance to be followed by Claire Baker. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, can I give you and Bill Kidd my apologies because I will not be able to stay to the end of the debate. I would like to congratulate Bill Kidd for bringing this motion to the Chamber and for allowing us to debate this highly relevant issue. As a member of this Parliament, I strongly welcome the Scottish Government's stance on global nuclear disarmament. However, there are two points I would like to focus on today. First, I want to speak about the disastrous effects of nuclear weapon testings. Second, I want to follow the motion's call for the complete removal of Trident's nuclear weapons system from Scotland. In launching this lawsuit at the International Court of Justice against the nine nuclear weapon states on the 24th of April 2014, the Republic of the Marshall Islands has taken an unprecedented but audacious step. It marks a crucial point towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. If successful in its claim, the Government of the Marshall Islands will not demand financial compensation, but abolishment of the country in question's nuclear arsenals. Considering the Marshall Islands' history, I believe this is to be a commendable decision. The Pacific Island state has, has been the site of 67 nuclear tests. On Bikini Atto alone, 23 nuclear bombs were tested between 1946 and 1955. This includes the first launch of an H-bomb in 1952 and corresponds to 7,000 times the force of a bomb dropped on Hiroshima. To remember the nuclear test conducted on Bikini Atto, the island was declared UNICEF's World Heritage Site in 2010. In this decision, UNICEF highlighted the importance to remember, I quote, the displacement of inhabitants, and the human irradiation and contamination caused by radionuclides produced by the tests. I believe that it is paramount to recall the fate of the Marshallese as it displays to us the destructive power of nuclear weapons 
death, ill health effects, environmental damage and issues of resettlement remain matters of great concern. As an example, Bikini Atoll's indigenous population, which was shipped out in 1946, still not have, have not been able to resettle on their island. I also want to take a chance to recall once again the effects of neutral weapon testing at Christmas Island in the Pacific Ocean on a British serviceman. Over 20,000 soldiers were exposed to radiation, who later on suffered from severe ill health and early deaths. The fact of 2,500 British ex-servicemen who were surveyed by the British Nuclear Test Veterans Association in 1999, 30% have since died, and the majority passed away in their early 50s, suffering from cancer. Additionally, the Veterans Association has observed higher rates of miscarriages among veterans' wives and their children, and a 10 times higher risk of experience defects at birth. Veterans in my constituency of Kirkcaldy, who were part of that nuclear testing programme, have also been experiencing the mentioned effects, together with their families, as well as the affected servicemen across the country. They are fighting the Ministry of Defence and its negligence and to take responsibility for the lasting health damage they endured. Presiding officer, we need to actively question the Ministry of Defence actions. It's about time that the Ministry starts to fully support veterans' families who are pred predicted to face severe health problems for many generations to come. Last, let me return to today's motion, calling for the complete removal of the UK's nuclear weapons base at Faz Lane. Around half of Scots have expressed their opposition to Trident. Furthermore, the renew renewal of Trident will consume 20 to 30 per cent of the Ministry of Defence budget, putting it under significant constraints. And we simply cannot ignore the UK's obligation as a signatory to a non-proliferation treaty to adhere to Article 6. As acknowledged by the Scottish Government, the internal, international opinion is distancing itself more and more from the proliferation of nuclear weapons. There is also an increased interest to display the truth about nuclear testing operations. Thus, we need to ask the Minister of Defence is reluctant to admit his past policies while insisting on the renewal of Trident. Presiding officer, let me conclude by saying that it is our responsibility in this chamber to put pressure on the UK Government with regards to disarmament obligations and to press for uncovering the truth regarding nuclear testing operations, whether affecting our own servicemen or the citizens of Marshall Island. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Claire Baker to be followed by Jamie McGregor. Um, thank you, President Officer. I'd firstly like to recognise the efforts of Bill Kidd in bringing this debate to the Chamber and also his tale of the horrific legacy of nuclear testing. Um, unfortunately, I'm going to give apologies to the Chamber and to the Cabinet Secretary for having to leave the debate early as I have a commitment in Fife. Um, the debate around Trident replacement is complex and I'm glad that tonight we can explore some of these issues. Um, I understand those who make a very clear commitment to scrapping renewal. I know that it comes from a deep-seated desire to see the end of nuclear weapons and a belief that not renewing Trident is a step towards achieving this. Um, I think that all of us in the Chamber share the desire to see the end of nuclear weapons. The question often is how is the best way to achieve this? So during these debates, whilst there will be disagreements among members, uh, we must remember we are all striving to reach the same goal. Um, it would seem counterintuitive to say that renewal of Trident helps deliver fewer weapons, but there are arguments which challenge this. The argument is that the UK's international role and influence it can exert um, has contributed towards the de-escalation of weapons. The argument goes that the UK's ability to have influence is partly delivered by maintaining Trident. It is the majority view of members in the Chamber that the UK and Scotland should remain in NATO, and although I know that members will challenge this, it is argued that UK's nuclear capacity is central to that membership. There is the question of compliance with the NPT obligations. There is an argument that Trident as a replacement is a like for like and so it doesn't breach the treaty, but it could be said it is not in the spirit of the treaty. No one would deny that Britain and Scotland need defence forces, but is Trident part of this future? There is a very strong argument that the world has changed dramatically since the Cold War. The proposition is that the threat no longer comes from big nation states having a standoff, but will come from terrorism, which was much more targeted and hidden. What does a country's nuclear capacity mean to a group who is attacking with no government, no country, no army behind it? This is the threat of our future and our defence and intelligence community need to focus on this. But we also have the challenge of trying to see into the future. The argument is made that work on a replacement cannot be delayed because submarines alone could take up to 17 years to develop. We can only prepare for our future defence needs based on our current understanding and predictions. There are no certainties. However, others see this as an opportunity to reduce our nuclear capacity as one that shouldn't be missed. 
Um, in government, Labour did reduce nuclear weapons and played a role internationally. The UK government has signed up to gradual disarmament negotiated in line with other nuclear nations. We would all like to see this achieved quicker, but if we're going to be fair during the debate, we should recognise the steps that have been taken. And the position we are in now is quite different from that 10 or 20 years ago. Since 1998, the UK has seen all of our air-delivered nuclear weapons withdrawn and dismantled. And from our Cold War peak, we've seen a reduction of our nuclear forces by well over 50%, and this is to be welcomed. There are a range of views on Trident um, across the Labour Party, and both Kezia Dugdale in Scotland and Jeremy Corbyn have said that the party will have the debate before a conclusive position is taken. Um, presiding officer, I grew up during the 1970s and 1980s. Um, campaigning against nuclear weapons was not my first political experience. Um, I had grown up um, going to Communist Party jumble sales and I even appeared on the front page of the Morning Star with Arthur Scargill. Um, I did grow up in Fife. Um, but when I was 12, I travelled to London, and that was my first visit to London, to take part in the CND rally, which ended in Hyde Park with over 300,000 people. It was my first real political act and decision. I was the youngest on an overnight bus which was filled with Labour Party members, including Alec Faulkner, who was our MEP at the time, and Communist Party members, political activists and my family. There was a huge show of public rejection that day of the nuclear arms race, and that public movement is important to making a change in UK and globally. And I welcome the debate that Trident is generating on the choices that are facing the UK in the future. Thank you, President Officer. Many thanks. I now call Jamie McGregor to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd firstly like to congratulate Bill Kidd on securing time for this debate. Uh, ever since the dawn of the atomic age, nuclear weapons have been a dividing issue. And the spread of different weapons of mass destruction has by and large defined power politics for the last seven decades. The Non-Proliferation Treaty is a cornerstone in attempting to create a global regime to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and by extension a nuclear war. The Marshall Islands were the testing ground for US nuclear weapons and testing stopped in 1962, but the radioactive fallout was significant and there's been an increase in cancer cases amongst the population, mainly cancer of the thyroid. The US has subsequently paid significant sums of money in compensation to the people of the Marshall Islands. As the radiation levels from the test dissipates, the dangers posed by these radioactive isotopes decreases. However, research shows that one of the main health concerns from the force is stem from the forceful displacement of the population and uprooting of their culture. And this has had significant and negative effect on the population, um, as has similarly been seen amongst the citizens of, of Pripyat that was forcefully evacuated after the Chernobyl incident. Last year, the Marshall Islands sued the UK and all other nuclear weapons powers for breaching its obligations stipulated by Article 6 of the Non-Proliferation Treaty to, in good faith, negotiate an end to the nuclear arms race and engage in negotiations to reduce the number of nuclear weapons in the world. Now, the UK government announced a few years ago that it is continuing to cut down on warheads by another 45, thus slowly disarming according to the treaty this is an ongoing case at the International Court of Justice, and the outcome of this case is uncertain, and any speculation regarding a ruling would be unwise. But it yet again brings forward the debate of the existence of nuclear weapons. Now, the SNP has for a long time been arguing in favor of the UK unilaterally disarming itself by removing our strategic nuclear deterrent. Now, such a policy would not just be futile, it would also be dangerous. The common argument for unilateral disarmament so often heard during the referendum campaign is that if the UK shows the way, other states would follow, as they would feel less threatened and thus more inclined to disarm as well. Well, there's no evidence at all of this, or to suggest that Russia or China would embark on a quest of disarmament just because we decided to do that. There are dangers lurking in the shadows due to disarmament policies. For the duration of the Cold War, the doctrine of mutually assured destruction prevented a cataclysmic war 
between the free world and the Eastern Bloc. Our nuclear arsenal ensures that Scotland is kept safe by an increasingly turbulent and dangerous world. Sorry, in, in an increasingly turbulent and dangerous world. And some might argue that the enemies of today are terrorist groups such as Islamic State, and that nuclear weapons either way uh, does not provide any protection from that. And this is probably true. But the world is constantly shifting, and new threats emerge continuously. And we should not, and must not, remove our deterrent. It's important that we take notice of the effects of nuclear testing, not only on the Marshall Islands, but around the world. Since joining the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in the 90s, the UK has not tested any nuclear weapons, and we have gradually decreased the size of the stockpile. But the fact remains, however, that we live in a very unstable world where nuclear weapons is providing safety for the people of the UK, and it would be a folly to give them up. So in conclusion, presiding officer, I have to note that the motion calls for the complete removal of the Trident nuclear weapons stored at Faz Lane, and this would also be detrimental uh, to employment in Argyll and Butte, as Faz Lane sustains 7,000 jobs in the area, and it's already threatened by depopulation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. And I now call Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Bill Kidd on bringing this motion and pay tribute to the courage and endurance of the people of the Marshall Islands after all they have endured. Can I also... Mr Chisholm, could you lift your microphone up, please? Can I also um, um, put my apologies to Bill Kidd and the Minister because I'm chairing the cross-party group on cancer, which is due to start exactly now, actually. Now, this motion looks at Trident renewal from the point of view of the non-proliferation treaty. The non-proliferation treaty was a bargain. The nations without nuclear weapons promise not to develop them in exchange, nuclear weapon states promise to pursue negotiations towards nuclear disarmament. In the words of Article 6, negotiate in good faith cessation of the nuclear arms race and nuclear disarmament. And it's on that basis that the people of the Marshall Islands have brought this case to the International Court of Justice, uh, saying that the nuclear weapon state have, states have failed to meet uh, their duties and therefore are in breach of, of international law. Now, Lord Murray, who was a former Lord Advocate as well as a former MP for Leith, has stated that it is not obvious that the UK can offer a statable defence. And Lord Bramall, a former Chief of the Defence Staff, said in a debate in the House of Lords on the 24th of January 2007, and I quote, it is difficult to see how the UK can exert any leadership and influence on the implementation of the Non-Proliferation Treaty if we insist on a successor to Trident. Now, we all know about the moral objections to Trident, although not everybody shares them in this chamber or out of it, but uh, it would deliver death and destruction on an unprecedented and unimaginable scale. That's the core moral objection. But also, of course, we know that money is diverted from more worthwhile causes uh, to pay for Trident. But what the motion highlights is something else, and that's the legal objections to Trident. And we've got a clear uh, statement of the breach of the non-proliferation treaty. But of course, there was also a ruling of the International Court of Justice in 1996 that any use of nuclear weapons is of doubtful legality. And again, the same Lord Murray, uh, uh, my predecessor, uh, uh, and also uh, not as Lord Advocate, but as MP for Leith, uh, has been very strong in, in arguing that that also is a central legal objection uh, and in a sense a more fundamental legal objection uh, to having uh, nuclear weapons uh, at all. So uh, I think we should, in building the case against Trident, uh, those of us who uh, support that view should emphasise all the dimensions of the arguments, the moral arguments, the legal arguments, and also, I think, increasingly, the strategic and security objectives. I've quoted a former chief of the defence staff, and there are, in fact, many people in the military, perhaps not all of them speaking out, who actually object to Trident because they realise that there are far more useful means of defending this country uh, through conventional means. And of course, it's not just military people, but people with a deep knowledge of the military. And the main person to refer to 
uh, uh, for the for the sake of, um, of, of of the last speaker is um, the former Conservative Defence Secretary Michael Portelli, who I think has put a very uh, strong and cogent uh, strategic uh, uh, argument against the renewal of Trident. So I hope we will have a great debate on Trident, not just in the Labour Party over the next few months, but in the country, because we've never really had any meaningful debate about this, and most people still hold the views that they held uh, 30 or 35 years ago. Well, I'm pleased to say that I do anyway, but um, I think most people do. So I think a lot of these issues should be brought out into the uh, open, uh, and I, I hope that we will see as part of that a strong coalition against uh, uh, Trident that is able to put forward the moral arguments the legal arguments which this motion highlights, but also fundamentally, because this will be crucial for per persuading the majority of people, the security and strategic arguments against Trident as well. Thank you. I now call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Neil Findlay. Thank you, President Officer, and uh, I too commend Bill Kidd uh, for bringing this motion forward today. Um, and I commend uh, the Marshall Islands for bringing this case to the International Court of Justice. And we have the accused, the United States, Russia, China, France, India, Pakistan, Israel, North Korea, and the UK. The plucky Marshall Islands, 70,000 people are taking on the major military, political, and economic powers. Uh, some have described uh, what they're doing as a, a near chaotic venture. Uh, in my opinion, it's a brave attempt to safeguard all of our futures and should never uh, be compared to tilting at windmills. Uh, the Marshall Islands themselves know all about uh, nuclear testing. Uh, as has already been said, they have suffered 67 United States nuclear tests in the 1940s and 1950s. Uh, and one of those tests, the bomb that was exploded, was a thousand times greater than the little boy bomb that was dropped in Hiroshima. They know the consequences of nuclear testing. Uh, the Marshall Islanders deserve our respect and our support for bringing this case uh, to the International Court uh, in The Hague. Uh, and beyond that, I think that this case itself should give everybody, every one of the governments that I have mentioned, uh, time to think about what they are currently doing in these regards. And in particular, presiding officer, um, the United Kingdom government should think about what it is about to embark on. Spending £100 billion on new nuclear weapons at a in a time of austerity is abhorrent. Spending uh, money on nuclear weapons at any time is abhorrent, but particularly uh, when money is being cut left, right and centre and the poorest in our society are suffering greatly. So, the might of the accused, the United States, China, India, Israel, Russia, France, Pakistan, North Korea, and the United Kingdom, is being tackled by a small nation of 70,000 people. And what I can say about their courage here um, is that it is absolutely immense. And I hope that that courage and determination of the Marshall Islands will prove that nuclear weapons are a complete and utter folly and that we begin to see disarmament uh, uh, on this small planet of ours. Hats off to you, Marshall Islanders. Thank you. I now call Neil Finlay to be followed by George Adam. Thanks very much, President Officer, um, and thanks very much to uh, Bill Kidd for uh, bringing this motion forward. Um, it's my understanding that the Non-Proliferation uh, Treaty represents the only binding, binding multilateral treaty with its goal of disarmament and sign that was signed by the nuclear weapons states and Malcolm uh, Chisholm 
uh, read from it, quite a, a document indeed, I think we would all uh, agree on that when, when looking at it. Um, but the reality is that the treaty uh, didn't stop the arms race. We know that the major powers accumulated more and more uh, nuclear hardware. But what it did do, it did set and train the process of cooperation between uh, nuclear and non-nuclear states to prevent uh, proliferation. And I think that was a, a huge step forward uh, um, and we should be thankful for that because given the, the dangers that we see at the moment across the globe, the instability that we see and we have seen since the uh, treaty was signed, that we see the border disputes, territorial disputes, religious wars, civil wars, regional conflict. When we see all of that going on, we must all be thankful that uh, proliferation on a mass scale across and bringing in new states did not materialise. I think if it had, we would be in a very perilous position, an even more perilous position than we see uh, at the moment. The, the world is a, a dangerous enough place without a nuclear arms race and nuclear expansionism across a whole range of new states and within states. Um, like many people here, I've always been opposed to nuclear weapons, uh, I'm opposed to Trident renewal, uh, and I'm glad that more and more people are coming to that, uh, that point of view. I want to see Trident, uh, sorry, I don't want to see Trident sail from the Clyde to the Thames, the Mersey, the Tyne, to Barrow, or anywhere else in the UK. I want a, a UK free of nuclear weapons. I want a world free of nuclear weapons, and I want a world of peace and a world of justice. And I think many uh, share that goal. I know many people here today and many who are not here share that goal. And certainly. Jamie I McGregor. know Mr McGregor doesn't share that goal, but I'll take an intervention. Jamie McGregor. Mr McGregor, you have to put your card in, please. Your card doesn't appear to be in. Thank you, Jamie McGregor. Um, I do share the member's desire for a nuclear-free world, but it's just I think that unilateral disarmament when there are nuclear weapons elsewhere is, is, is a foolish policy. Neil Finlay, now give you your time back. That, that, that's, I'm glad you've put that on the record, uh, Mr McGregor. And we, can, we can disagree on the tactics. That I think that's, that should be part of the debate about how we rid the world of nuclear weapons, but the fact that we start from the same position is a good one, and I'm, I'm very pleased at that. Uh, in relation to the, uh, the, the Marshall Islands, I think this is a state that knows more than most that can tell the world a lot about uh, the impact of radiation, uh, having been the site, as many people have mentioned, of some of the most powerful uh, hydrogen bomb tests ever undertaken. Uh, and with all the dreadful consequences that, uh, that has been brought to the, uh, the people there, um, and the environment there, I think they have a lot to teach the world. Um, uh, I understand and support their desire to see the end of nuclear uh, prolif proliferation, and I think that desire is shared by many people. So I, I, I thank Bill Kidd for bringing this forward. Finally, I, can I also thank Bill Kidd for the motion that he put down in Parliament today uh, in tribute to Dr Alan McKinnon, a friend to many people in the peace movement uh, many people in the Communist Party and across the broad left of politics. Alan was a fantastic human being, a great loss to progressive politics. Uh, and I think it's up to us to keep up his work for a fair and just and more humane society and one that is free of nuclear weapons. Many thanks. I now call George Adam to be followed by John Finney. Thank you, President Officer, and can I thank Bill Kidd for bringing this debate, important debate, to the Chamber. The Marshall Islands are to be commended for their strength of will and vision on this issue. And Bill Kidd, uh, when he mentioned the fact that the Marshall Islands were put into trust by the United Nations, he brings up that important word, President Officer, trust. That's one of the most important words you'll probably hear in this debate, because 
Where is the trust? Do we trust ourselves to live in a world without nuclear weapons? And do we trust our fellow nations of the world to look to that future without nuclear weapons? And I think Malcolm Chisholm summed up uh, some of the debate here as well when he said that many of us have had this ideal for 30 years plus. And for me, the debate started in the 1980s like Claire Baker when we were younger. We believed we were going to be, because of the Gold War, the generation that ended in nuclear Armageddon. Now, that seems like distant in the past now, but that was a fear as a teenager in the 80s. And it was one of the reasons why I was attracted to join the SNP, because at that time you had the argument over Polaris and Trident. And now we have the same debate over whether we should go from the, the next generation of Trident as well. And as Kevin Stewart has already said, you know, to spend that amount of money, £100 billion on these weapons when other things are, and people are struggling in our nation is just absolutely disgusting. But, you know, there has uh, been ongoing issues, and I like to talk about people, presiding officer, to believe politics are about people. And on this occasion, I'll talk about a man that's not from Paisley, but actually next door in Johnston, and it's Ken McGinley who was someone who was a soldier, went over to Christmas Island when Britain uh, tried to do their test uh, in the Pacific nuclear tests as well. And he was across there as a 19-year-old young man who was from Johnston, hadn't been round the world at all himself. But he, Ken since has become like, a close friend of mine and someone whose opinion that I actually really do respect. And he's told me exactly uh, how he felt on that day when, the te when they were tested. He wore a white overall. That was all the protection they were given. They were wearing khaki shorts. He says, you know, when he went out there, I'd never heard of a hydrogen bomb or the atomic bomb. And I was only vaguely aware of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, but he was there when Grapple Y, one of Britain's biggest nuclear tests ever happened, a three megaton monster was actually dropped. And as he sat on the beach at the time, he started to become increasingly worried about all the kind of crazy thoughts, his words, not mine, that were going through his mind at that point. And he, he knew that as the day got closer, there were soldiers who were braver than him, he believed, that we're starting to have doubts. But on that day, he said, suddenly I could have no more misgivings as a voice came through the tannoy that said, this could be a live run. It said dramatically, five, four, three, two, one, zero. He says, and then it happened, cover your eyes. He was told to cover his eyes as a three megaton bomb was actually unleashed uh, within the vicinity. And at that point, Ken has said that he put his hands over and he could see every single part of the innards of his body as the heat went by. He also mentioned the fact that when the heat came, it wasn't as if someone had put on an electric fire behind you. It was as if the electric fire, about a thousand of them, had actually gone right through you. Now, Ken, like many other people, haven't had their troubles to seek. You know, Ken came back, he's had many health problems, and he's also found that uh, when he came back to the UK, he had an undiagnosed ulcer that burst, and it was only when he collapsed. He found later on that he was infertile, and he's had skin complaints and cysts and other conditions that followed. But this has happened to many people, many people who have had to deal with that, who are there just doing their national service, who are there actually... For Ken, the, th the big thing was actually a stop-off in Hawaii going over to Christmas Island. That was the main part for 19-year-old Ken. And I think that the nations of the world have to take a responsibility when they're dealing with nuclear weapons. They have to admit that they were wrong to do that in the past. They were wrong to do these tests in the Pacific Islands. And they have to learn that we need to trust one another. We need to trust and we need to work together to ensure that we never have anything like this again and we can have a world that no longer has these nuclear weapons. Thank you. I now call John Finney to be followed by Chick Brodie. Thank you, President Officer. Can I join with others in congratulating Bill Kidd for this motion, but also congratulating him on all his work he does um, in the nuclear field. He's very respected around the, the world, and quite rightly so, and this is just the latest manifestation of that. The motion talks about an obligation in good faith, and certainly when it comes to successive UK governments, I would suggest that that's a course of conduct they've found very challenging when it comes to military and particularly nuclear matters to, to respond to. It also talks about the cessation of the nuclear race, and we know that following the UK Chancellor's recent visit, that's not going to happen. Money indeed is no object. Well, not if these objects are weapons of widespread indiscriminate civilian slaughter like uh, Trident. 
Trident must be decommissioned, and uh, I think uh, it's good to hear voices in support of that around the chamber. Uh, of course, nuclear testing is responsible for uh, vile impacts well short of slaughter, and we know that that's been visited on the, the Marshall Islands in particular. Now, they were uh, colonised in the second millennium BC by uh, micro, micro Asian uh, colonists uh, who gradually settled there, but like many parts of the world, they were exploited in successive orders by the Spanish, the English, the German, Japanese, and then the US, the great improvers, because every island needs nuclear testing. And we know and we've heard that the US tested 67 nuclear weapons, an obscene course of behaviour. And the largest test of all, uh, Castle Bravo. Now, I respect the Marshall Islanders for taking legal action, and that's worthy of the, the, the term bravo. Um, we know that the, uh, by 1956, the US Atomic Energy Commission had regarded the Marshall Islands as, quote, by far the most contaminated place in the world. Uh, and we know that there's claims ongoing. We know the health effects linger. We know of Project 4.1, a medical study by US residents, uh, by US of the residents of Bikini Atoll exposed to the radioactive fallout. And as we've seen elsewhere on the planet, the pernicious effect of the arms trade and the investigations that go along with that um, are often visited um, on um, undeserved... Well, not that they would ever be deserving recipients of that. These relationships are about power. They're also about respect, and the so-called developed countries have displayed little respect to places like the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and they are worthy of our utmost respect, and not least for the action in 2014 when they filed the applications at the International Court of Justice. Um, it's the principal judicial organ of the UN, and its role is to settle in accordance with international law legal disputes submitted to it by states. I won't rehearse the, the countries that have... Uh, the, the nine countries of shame, but uh, they are contributing little to the cause of humanity by their course of action. He will. Kevin Stewart. Mr Finney, for giving way, I think we should name the accused nine as much as we possibly can so that the people know the perpetrators of these weapons of mass destruction. So the accused, I think, need to be listed as often as we possibly can. John Finney. I, I, I take Mr Stewart's point. In the time-limited debate, nonetheless, I will confirm that it's the United States the United Kingdom, not in my name, France, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, Israel and North Korea. And you are right that uh, um, these cases uh, are founded um, on the uh, unanimous conclusion of the International Criminal uh, Court of Justice in 1996. And I'll quote, there exists an obligation to pursue in good faith and bring to a conclusion negotiations leading to nuclear disarmament in all its aspects under strict and effective international control. And it's also important to say that the action was about ensuring that that opinion isn't allowed to lie dormant or be ignored. And it covers things like refusing to commence multilateral negotiations, implementing policies contrary to the objective of nuclear disarmament, as we heard from uh, uh, the, the likely replacement of Trident, and a breach of the obligation to pursue negotiations in good faith on cessation of the nuclear arms race at an early date. And I can't stress enough the, the influence of the arms trade that, that it plays in this. So I think there are many challenges our planet faces, not least climate change, and that will require collaboration of the nations. The Republic of the Marshall Islands, rather than the nine nuclear states, in my mind, dem demonstrably care about humanity. I applaud their actions, wish them well in making the world a better place, and wish the action every success. Thank you. Thank you. And I now call Chick Brody. Officer, may I also thank uh, Bill Kidd for bringing forward the debate this evening on the UK's obligations to the Non-Proliferation Treaty and the plight of the Marshall Islands. Presenting officer conferences to review the NPT take place every five years. At the last conference in 2010, the five major nuclear powers reaffirmed, and I quote, their unequivocal, unequivocal undertaking to accomplish the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals leading to nuclear disarmament. They also committed to undertake further efforts to reduce and ultimately eliminate all types of nuclear weapons. Uh, of course, progress uh, since 2010 has been sporadic, to say the least. There has been a growing focus and concern uh, of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons by many non-nuclear states, by the United Nations and other NGOs throughout the world. And indeed, the ongoing refugee crisis throughout not only Europe but in many parts of the world underlines the importance of bringing peace and stability to many parts of that world. 
Our energies and strategies and international economic drivers should be guided towards creating political, socio and economic landscapes to allow countries to thrive and for their peoples to live in peace. Uh, foreign policy mistakes over the years have created uh, refugee situations in many parts of the world. The 2013 UN conference presiding officer organized on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. It was used by non-nuclear countries uh, to push for development of a nuclear weapons convention that would outlaw possession of such weapons as a first step towards total elimination, total elimination. This brings us to the spotlight, the, the, to spotlight the UK's position on its Trident successor program, which would replace the UK's nuclear deterrent from 2018 if it is approved. The, nuclear, the UK's nuclear deterrent is thought to be around 225 nuclear warheads. The US has around 5,000 and Russia is believed to have the same amount. The 2015 NPT conference allowed the opportunity for the UK to make uh, a commitment to the undertaking it made in 2010, which was their, as I repeat, their unequivocal undertaking to accomplish the total elimination of their nuclear arsenals uh, leading to nuclear disarmament. And here in Scotland, as we just said at Fuzz Lane, we are host to the UK's nuclear deterrent, only 25 miles from our biggest city, which has a population of 600,000. And only a matter of weeks ago, a 20-vehicle military convoy travelled across Scotland using specially built built vehicles which transport nuclear weapons. John Aisley, the coordinator of Scottish CND, said 70 years ago Hiroshima was destroyed by an atomic bomb. What brought me to the belief in total nuclear disarmament was the book by John Hersey, who wrote of Hiroshima, and I quote, there was no sound of planes. The morning was still, the place was cool and pleasant. Then, a tremendous flash of light cut across the sky. And Mr. Tanemoto, who is the moderate, the pastor of the Hiroshima Methodist Church, said it seemed like a sheet of sun. He had never, uh, he said he lived a dozen lives at that moment and saw more death than he thought he would ever see. 100,000 people killed. So that's why it is right that we support the, the people of the Marshall Islands in suing the nine countries at The Hague. Uh, it is, as they state, a flagrant, a flagrant denial of human justice. Uh, and when one considers that only one bomb, a 15 megaton bomb, the Bravo shot, Bravo shot a, equivalent to a thousand Hiroshima blasts, exponentially means if we apply the figures in Hiroshima, it applies to 100 million deaths, 20 times the population of Scotland. So, Presiding Officer, we support the Marshall Islands. We wish them success. And in doing so, the people of Scotland do not want nuclear weapons. It's time the UK took their obligation to the NPT uh, seriously. Trident renewal will cost the UK £100 billion, and Scotland may have to pay its share. So let Scotland confront that, and let it be a beacon to the rest of the world as a country that wholly rejects nuclear weapons and takes its obligation to the NPT seriously. Thank you. Thank you. And can I now invite Keith Brown to respond to the debate. Cabinet Secretary, seven minutes or so. Uh, thank you, President Officer. I can also uh, thank Bill Kidd for securing this debate and, as John Finney has done, acknowledge the wider work that Bill Kidd has taken now on over a number of years uh, in pursuit of the abolition of nuclear weapons. Um, as has been mentioned, he has a growing international reputation for having done that and the Chamber is lucky to have him, in my view. Uh, Bill Kidd's debate has also allowed the opportunity for members across the chamber to make clear their position on whether they believe that the UK government is committed to nuclear disarmament and if it is doing all it can to make this a reality. Now, the Scottish government has been consistent and steadfast in its opposition to the possession and the threat of nuclear weapons, and we've called on the UK government to lead by example on disarmament and in light of its location and impact in Scotland to work with us on the safe and complete withdrawal of Trident. And yet, as George Osborne's announcement of the 31st of August demonstrates, the UK Government continues to prepare the way for a new generation of Trident-carrying submarines operating from HMNB Clyde into the second half of this century and potentially beyond. It is difficult for me, and I think for many others, to reconcile that stance with a genuine commitment towards nuclear disarmament. 
Uh, Presiding officer, while the Republic of the Marshall Islands case against the UK government is a matter for the International Court of Justice, uh, the Scottish Government, for our part, can certainly sympathise with the Marshall Islands on the issue of nuclear weapons. Our history, of course, of nuclear weapons is, of course, different from those of the Marshall Islanders, as we've heard. But we do share a common belief that there should be no place for nuclear weapons in our world today, and that there's an obligation on each and every nation to do all that it can to realise that vision. And so we therefore recognise their frustration and the frustration of many nations, many organisations and individuals, including some who are in the chamber and in the gallery today, at the apparent lack of progress in the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. And whilst it's been mentioned by some members about the reduction in the numbers of warheads, what's not been mentioned is the increase in the capacity of those warheads at the same time. Uh, Presiding officer, I'd like to respond to the arguments that have been put forward in support, although they have been fairly rare tonight, of nuclear weapons. We've heard a great deal of talk about the role of nuclear weapons in national and international security. And I, for my part, and I think many people here do not accept the suggestion that they are a necessary evil. Uh, nuclear weapons do not make us more secure, uh, as the UK and other states have unfortunately seen. The possession of uh, nuclear weapons has not deterred terrorist acts. In fact, if you think about it for a second, the very presence of terrorist acts should make us more concerned about possessing nuclear weapons in the first place. And I think we had a kind of Orwellian use of language from Jamie McGregor when he said or implied it was more dangerous not to have nuclear weapons than it was to have nuclear weapons. That kind of argument is where we were led to with the nuclear uh, arms race, and we should reject that argument. It's also been said by Malcolm Chisholm and others, uh, some of the very high-level military figures who have also spoken out, and political figures, Michael Portillo said, Trident was completely past its sell-by date, it's a waste of money, and is no deterrent to the Taliban. Uh, Malcolm Chalmers, well known in def the defence circle, said, even if the MOD manages to secure the continuing 1% annual growth in total equipment spending, to which the government was committed itself, sharp increases in spending on Trident renewal in the early 2020s seem set to mean further years of austerity for conventional equipment plans. Now, it's worth bearing in mind that the cost of Trident is equivalent to a third of the capital budgets of all three services. And I can tell you from my experience, there's many people in the services that believe it's a far worse deal to invest £100 billion in Trident than it is to invest in the soldiers that have received P-45s as they're serving on the front line, or the massive defence cuts that have taken place in terms of conventional defence. And Toby Fenwick from the Centre Forum said, replacing Trident is nonsensical. There's no current or medium-term threat to the UK which justifies the huge costs involved. But even to get to that position of trying to justify it on security grounds, you have to accept a moral case for it. You have to accept there must be circumstances, if you support the purchase of Trident, that it would be legitimate to use those weapons in. And I think most people in this chamber reject that assertion. There is no circumstance, none that I can think of, where it would be justifiable to use uh, nuclear weapons. And if you don't believe there's one um, on that side of the argument, on the other side of the argument, you can't support having nuclear weapons if you don't at the same time support some circumstance in which it would be possible and acceptable to use them. And one of the main reasons for that is, unlike most of conventional defence, Trident is utterly indiscriminate. It destroys civilian populations who may have played no part in some uh, beginnings of a war, and they themselves suffer hugely. And in the majority, the casualties will be civilian casualties when any nuclear weapon is used. Uh, and as for the argument that nuclear weapons provide a security blanket against some unspecified future threat, what, rail do they, what role do they have in responding to the real long-term issues that we face, such as climate change, again mentioned uh, by John Finney and others, sustainable economic development uh, and mass migration? Uh, it's the Scottish Government's view that the UK's nuclear weapons are maintained uh, and would be renewed at the expense, as I've said, of conventional defence equipment and personnel, capabilities which are far more utility to respond to current and future threats. It's therefore our position that HMNB Clyde has a valuable role to play as a conventional naval base. Uh, presiding officer, there are a range of reasons, political and economic, why the nuclear weapon states would not go to war with each other today or in the future. Uh, I, for one, do not believe that we can credibly argue that nuclear weapons are necessary for our security. Uh, there were many good speeches made today, Kevin Stewart, on the uh, nature of the fight undertaken by the Marshall Islanders. I think they've had general support from most people who have spoken in the debate. Uh, I very much appreciated Malcolm Chisholm's welcome for the debate, because that's not always been the response that we've had when we've raised the issue of Trident in this chamber. It's vitally important for Scotland, as a number of people have mentioned, and I think it is important that we have this debate. 
I think finally, President Officer, as recent history has shown, so long as any country has nuclear weapons, others will want them. Uh, and as well, as well to point out the dilemma in trying to say to other countries, no, you can't have them, you're not responsible, but we are. We can have them because we are more responsible than you. There's no moral um, a force behind that argument. And the consequences of a nuclear exchange, whether by accident or by design, and of course the potential for accidents or misunderstandings is always there, it would result in unspeakable humanitarian suffering. When we heard the strength of some of these bombs that are being tested in the Marshall Islands from Chick Brody, we can imagine the level of human suffering uh, and the huge environmental damage, again, like that which has been suffered in the Marshall Islands. Uh, so, presenting officer, as we debated in the Parliament on the 20th of March uh, 2013, the Scottish Government supports the UN Secretary General Ban Ki Moon's five point plan on nuclear disarmament as a framework for the UK and other nuclear weapon states to take serious and significant steps towards nuclear disarmament. We therefore call again on the UK Government to cancel plans to renew their Trident submarine fleet and to lead the way in both negotiations and actions towards nuclear disarmament. Uh, presenting officer, I would uh, leave by uh, a quote, so using a quote from the International Committee of the Red Cross, which puts into focus the threat of nuclear weapons and the responsibility that we share in the pursuit of their withdrawal. Nuclear weapons, they say, are unique in their destructive power, in the unspeakable human suffering they cause, in the impossibility of controlling their effects in space and time, and in the threat they pose to the environment, to future generations, and indeed to the survival of humanity. And some mention was made, presenting officer, of how long we have held these views. I remember in 1986, proposing a motion a model United Nations in the United Nations building in New York to the first committee on disarmament, exactly along these lines, which was passed. And I'd very much hope to see further success for these kind of uh, motions, this kind of uh, point of view in New York at the United Nations. And so, presenting officer, the Scottish Government supports the aims of this motion. Thank Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. That concludes Bill Kidd's debate on the NPT, the Marshall Islands and the UK Government's failure to meet its obligations. And I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>